turn to Matthew 5, please. Matthew 5. Um, we'll be going through verses 13 through 16. The passage says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us here today to worship and praise your name, Lord, and even have this opportunity. Thank you for giving everyone here a good bill of health to come here and worship you, Lord, and for everybody who's sick, Lord, be with them and heal them in this time of need and be with all of our other church members who went through procedures and are going through ailments, Lord, heal them too. And Lord, be with all of our sister churches as they preach your word here tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So every couple weeks, I end up going to the grocery store. And when I go to the grocery store, I end up making one big loop around the store. So I start off, I go right to the deli, I get what I need. After going through the deli, you know, I make my way to the produce department, not much need there. Because, but after the produce department, I get excited, very excited, because then it's the meat department. And I'm a very avid fan of eating meat, so I look through the meat and seeing what I could buy for the week, and I usually buy everything I think I have a chance of eating, and I buy it all up. Then I go finish my grocery shop. And I go home and put my meat, the meat, in the fridge. And I have it for whenever I want to cook it. Well, the problem is, is that I personally do not like to cook often. Either it's being tired or just me being lazy. I always find an excuse for myself to not cook. So, when you buy a lot of meat and you don't use it, it tends to go bad. It goes grossly bad. It turns gray. Why? Because meat has a shelf life. Meat has a timetable. It only has so long until it becomes corrupted. But the way to prevent meat from going bad so quickly, the way of preventing it from corruption is through preservation. And one of the best ways of preservation is salt. And salt is used to resist the decay and the corruption of the meat. And today we see our Lord and Savior calling us, us this salt, calling us this preserver of the earth. So we look at our first point tonight, and that is that we must resist decay. It says in verse 13, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Yes, salt is to resist decay. No, salt is not able to change it back when it's already decayed, but it is able to preserve it from further decay to resist that foul smell from coming, to resist the meat from going gray, to resist that putrid smell, to resist the corruption that awaits it. And here we are called the salt of the earth. We are the ones to serve as that resistor, to serve as the preserver. And Jesus here says, ye are the salt of the earth. We look further in this verse, and the word here translated from earth is gay, G-E. And the word gay is specifically used here to refer to earth 
distinctively away from heaven. Why? Because there is not any need for salt in heaven. Heaven is perfect. There's no need to preserve anything in heaven. There's no turning gray in heaven. There's no putrid smell in heaven. None of that corruption could get into heaven. It was cast out. But this shows us where we are to be the salt at. And that is here on earth, or yay. But yay is also a, a parochial word. And it suggests it's a special land, or country, or region. And it's distinct from other areas. So gay also suggests it from the soil, as well as it conveys the idea of a material side of life. So there are two main things here. We are the salt, and the people are the earth. And where we live, we live in a world full of people that hold on to material things and worldly things. And we are to be the salt for those people. We, as Christians, are the ones who are there to try to preserve them from the corruption the world brings. To prevent them from going down the bad path. We are here to give them the gospel. To show them the righteous way of living through Jesus Christ. And we are to show them the love and mercy of God from sending His Son. That's what it means to be salt. That's what it means to preserve. It's not through our actions. It's not through our ideas. But it's through the power of Christ that gives us this effect as salt. Think about it. Salt is a very miraculous thing. It's a miracle. If salt is composed of sodium and chloride, but it has to be perfectly balanced. Let's put this into perspective. If you take hydrochloric acid and you put it on your hands, it will burn your hands away. If you drink it, you will die in agony. But if you add sodium to hydrochloric acid, you have salt. The salt that we use is one of the most common substances. It's a substance that is necessary for life. I mean, think about it. You ever see those animals that climb literally up steep mountains, standing on a thing you wouldn't have no clue how to stand on just to get salt for survival? Salt is very necessary, and it's a blessing upon life. But, it needs to be balanced. It needs the sodium. Otherwise, it's deadly. And God is that sodium to us. He is the one who balances us. He is the one who helps us preserve, not burn. God is the one who makes us beneficial and makes us a useful preserver. And we are useful preservers by proclaiming His Word and being examples as his children. Thus, why Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. Another thing to point out is that salt is aseptic. And that means that although salt preserves, it cannot change. Once a piece of meat is corrupted, once it goes bad, you cannot put salt on the meat and make it good again. You can't make it fresh. We, as the salt of the earth, cannot make things anew. Because that's not in our power. So many of us try to make this in our power. We try to get people to change. We try to bring them to Christ ourselves. We try to save them ourselves. We force feed them Jesus so that they will understand and that they will bring and so that we can bring salvation upon them. We do it because we love them. But no, this is not our power as salt. We do not have the ability to make one anew. Only God can make one anew. Only God can make one reborn. Only God can turn the gray piece of meat back into a pink, fresh piece of meat. No, as the salt of the earth, we can't make one new but we can preserve and resist the decay. That's our job as the salt of the earth. To prevent 
further corruption, to prevent it from getting any grayer, to help resist the spread, to take the spiritual battlefield and fight for God and His righteousness, to show others God's glory, to show His love and mercy, to stop the spread of the wickedness and vileness that is just going around. It is to act on behalf of God. And doing these things is what preserves the world. It's what makes us salt. It says, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. We talked about the word earth or gay a little bit already. But it's important to know that the earth, how it is separated from heaven, is filled with this corruption. It's filled with disaster. And we, as the salt of the earth, are the medium in which we bring heavenly things and exert it upon earthly things. So know this, that we are heavenly people meant to live a heavenly way in an earthly environment. Listen, we talked about salt preservation, but let's look at the most common way we look at salt. Something we add to the food. It enhances the flavor and adds that tang to it. But, and that is also what we as Christians are here to do on earth. We are to ex exert and enhance our heavenly side and enhance our godly influence to the world the corrupt world. That's why we make sure that we are being a right influence, that we are living the way God wants us to live, that we are giving Scripture the way God wants Scripture to be read. That's why knowing the Scripture is very important. That's why we stay true to the most reliable translation. Because there are many people on this earth that go wrong. And there are many people on this earth that are proclaiming to be the salt of the earth, yet preserving nothing. It says, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Moral of the story, if you are a contaminated piece of salt, you do not promote purity. It does not resist corruption. It does not do the job it's intended for. You will not preserve a thing if you are a corrupted piece of salt. The words in this verse, lost his Savior, indicates a foolish behavior. It indicates immorality. This is describing the professing believer whose lifestyle is not godly and promotes destruction rather than preservation. Is describing one who has lost his ability to influence. Such salt will not preserve anything. In fact, they would use the contaminated salt to put over vegetation so weeds and other things won't grow. It's used to kill. Thus, what a believer comes when he has lost his savior, nothing can grow where that salt is. Then what? As the Bible says in verse 13, it is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. This is not saying you're going to lose your salvation, but it's saying you're becoming worthless to the cause. And when you lose your Savior, that you will be trodden on by the world, treated bad. Folks, this is a wake-up call. We have an important role to play here on earth. We are here to help resist the decay of the world, to be influences to many, to show them God's greatness. But in order to do so, we must not be hypocrites, but doers of the Word of God. And like in Matthew 28, we are to go out and tell the world this is the way to resist decay. This is the way to be an effective preserver. 
So we go over talking about resisting decay in this world, but our second and final point is about removing, removing darkness. It's the next step. It says in verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill cannot be hid. So after saying that we are the soul of the earth, and that is dealing in a more moral sense, Jesus goes on to call us the light of the world. And this is dealing more in a spiritual sense. Salt relates to who we are. But light relates to what we do. Salt is about character. Light is about conduct. That's what we're going to be looking at. So first, let's remember, what does light do? What does light do? Light is here to remove darkness. And who is the light of the world? Who is the one who removed the darkness? Who was the one that was the light for us? Jesus Christ. Christ is the light of the world. That's what John 9, 5 says. But then Jesus says here in Matthew that we are the light of the world. And these statements are not contradictory because this is Jesus saying that we are to be like Him. We, He is who we look up to. He is who we are supposed to model ourselves after. He is the great and prime example we're supposed to look at and to follow. We just talked about it with salt. Now we're talking about it with being the light of the world. We must be like Him. We must try and act like Him. Not be hypocrites to what we go around and share. Because imposters will never be able to drive out darkness. You'll never be able to be in an effective light. We can tell early on about someone's true character. You can see the darkness. We can see that around them. It says, Ye are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill, cannot be hid. The word here for world is cosmos, which points to the whole created order of things. And the root of the word also means plain, polish, and carve. So this world, this word, yeah, so this word is implying an order and a beauty. So when we become the light for this world, our purpose is to advise people of the natural order that God created things and our relation to it and their relation to it. But as well, we are to show them the beauty of it, the beauty of our created universe that is subject to God's power. This is very important, yet it has become a lot more difficult in society today. Society keeps pushing in our education systems the theory of evolution. And this theory rejects God as the creator. It rejects the truth of God. It rejects all truth. It hides it. And society has kept spiraling down away from the word of God and rejecting his truths ever since. This is having many effects on the world today and not for the better. Thus, the need for light in the world. Thus, the importance of a Christian to act like Christ and to model ourselves after Him. Listen, we are here to remind everyone of the sovereignty and authority of God just as Jesus did. In the garden, before the cross, in agony, and knowing what was to come, he prayed, but he prayed for his Father's will to be done. That's what God wants from us. He, that's how Christ wants us to follow and to act in the very same matter, manner than, that he did. To obey God and to do His will. Then Jesus goes on to say, Ye are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill, cannot be hid. So Jesus here is using a city as an illustration for us. And the city here is used as an example to be a light in a group way. 
It indicates all the lights being shined together as one. One large testimony of what Christ has done. But the city is made of everybody's individual candles. Look at verse 15. It says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. The candle is here to represent us, to tell us about the light in a more individual setting. It indicates our own personal testimony, our own personal way of being like Christ. Where I'm going with this is that everybody needs to have their candle lit up to light a city. Our church is a city. And when you become that city, you cannot be hid. The world cannot conceal you. And they will try to conceal you. They will try to push you under the rug because they do not want you to thrive. But the light of the city will be so bright from Christ that it will overcome all darkness. It's just not possible to just walk by it and not see it or to ignore it. The world will see it. And that's the goal. And that's how Christ came into the life of us believers. He came as a light. He destroyed that darkness. Listen, we can't save people, but we can be a light in this world to show them what Jesus Christ has done. Show them the beauty of what Christ has done. Plant the seed in their head and let God do the rest. But again, that city is lit up by Christian houses and their candles. We need our own candle burning. We need our household to see the light of that candle. It says, but on a candlestick and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Don't hide it under a bushel. Don't hide it from others. There's no need to hide it because we only hide things when we are embarrassed of things. But the light of Christ should not be one of those things that we are embarrassed about. Shouldn't. And if it is something you're embarrassed about, it's something you need to reflect on. Why are you embarrassed? Why are you embarrassed about Christ? The Christ who redeemed you, it's something to be proud of, something we should share so that people can see the light from it. If you hide a candle under a bushel, what good is that candle? What value does it serve? It doesn't serve much purpose. It doesn't have much value. A candle is most valuable when you can see the light it produces. And it's the same with us. We provide the most value when people can see the light that shines from us through Christ's power. Then it says in verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's made all so clear. Let the light shine. Let people see it shine. Show them the works that are a byproduct of this life and be the light. Be the salt. And you know what light and salt have in common? They put their influence on things silently. They aren't loud with what they do. You don't hear much speaking from light and salt. It isn't publicly known when you use salt or when you see light. And we are to be similar examples. Not to peak ourselves highly. Not to look upon our deeds highly. But at the end of this verse says, to glorify the Father which is in heaven. This is huge because we easily like to take credit for what we do. We like to think that we are a good preserver on our own. That we are a bright light on our own. But it's only through God's grace and power that we are effective preservers and bright lights. Therefore, when good comes from these gifts... We need to give glory to the one who provided those gifts. 
We need to give glory to the one who made it possible to give glory to our heavenly father from above. And remember, Jesus perfected this. And we are to try and be fully like him. And that's where our goal is here today. Finally, on the conversation of light, I want to bring up how similar to salt, it's another great miracle. A miracle that is great and as wonderful as salt is. Because just as salt makes life possible here on earth, physical salt, life, light makes life possible in heaven. Because Jesus is the true light. The light from heaven. And you need that light to achieve salvation. That light is what conquers darkness. And it's truly a miracle for the believer of Christ. We're in need of that light just as much as we are in need of salt here on earth. Concluding, I want us to think about the two words we talked about. Resist and remove. Resist the corruption on earth. Be a preserver for God here on earth. Act the way God wants you to act. And know that salt loses its value when you lose at your Savior. Savor. Don't lose your savor. Don't lose that passion. Don't fall to the world. Do not become, as the verse says, good for nothing. But keep your savor and be an effective tool in Christ's shed. But we also need to remove. Remove darkness from around us. And we know the way to remove darkness is through light. And Christ tells us to be the light by being like the true light, and that is Jesus Christ. Do not be afraid or scared to show that light. See it as a blessing. Show it to your home. Show it to your neighbors. Go out and preach the Word. And then the beauty of it is when you have multiple lights lit up, just like here today, you have a city that is shining bright. And it's a city that people can't just walk past. These are the tasks, especially as we go through the week, that we need to think on to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for again for bringing us up here. Lord, help us to go into this world and be good preservers and a light for you, Lord, that we may show people the way and give the gospel fr fruitfully. Lord, we ask this all through your power. Lord, bless us as we go. Keep us safe. Keep us from illness, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.